are so merciful, Lord, unto me. Yet you still open doors that I can't even. Praise God. Struggling to see. Praise God. Are you in the book of James? Before we look at the scripture, I want to remind you about Jesus' time of fasting. Remember when Jesus was preparing to lay his life down? He, 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 was, he literally came to the earth to be a sacrifice for you and I. And sometimes we take that very lightly. Sometimes we, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't realize and remember just how much of a sacrifice that is. Think about if you were asked to lay your life down unto the death for someone else. This is what Jesus was asked to do. And although he didn't struggle with it, the Bible tells us that he was all God, but he was walking around as man. And he was tempted at all points, even as we are. Amen? And if you're going to lay your life down for someone else, you've got to prepare for it. Amen. It's not something I believe that any of us can just, just go do. So the Bible tells us that Jesus went into the wilderness. And he went to fast for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And while he was in the wilderness, he was, I mean, Satan came to really mess with him. Amen. Praise God. Satan came to tempt him and and came to challenge him and, and to take, Satan began to lay traps for Jesus. Can you imagine that? Now I want you to know something. If Satan came and laid traps for Jesus, he's, he's going to lay a trap for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if he's going to come and, and, and try to tempt Jesus, how may know how much, how much is he still going to come and tempt you and I to get us distracted and get us off course? Well, that's what was happening in the wilderness. And after Jesus came out of the fast, there were challenges and trials. Well, I'm not going to teach that today, but I want to, I want to set that up because we have just come out of a season of fasting. We have just come out of 21, some of us for 23 days of consecrated Daniel fast and total water fast. And we've been praying daily. We've been seeking God. Amen. And I want you to understand that even though there may be a greater, hopefully there is a greater depth of relationship, a greater depth of hearing God's voice, the enemy will want to come and steal, kill, and destroy. I'm reminded of this passage of scripture when thinking about what Jesus went through and thinking about we are in a time after a time of fasting and the trials and challenges that come. And I'm reminded and taken to this scripture here found in the book of James. Are you with me in James, the first chapter? And I want to I want to share this from a couple different versions of scripture because I want you to hear it a couple of different ways. Verse number two says, my brethren. Now. When, when the scripture is talking about our brethren, it is speaking to those of us that believe in Jesus Christ, that have received him. Amen? So this scripture is literally talking to those of us that proclaim that we're Christians, that, that have received Jesus Christ. My brethren tells us, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or different temptations. Why? Knowing this. That the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire. Wanting nothing. Listen to the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version of Scripture says, Consider it holy, joyful. Consider the joy that comes with it. Whoever you are enveloped in or whatever you encounter by trial or any sort of fall into various temptations, be assured and understand that the trial 
and the proving of your faith, it brings out endurance and steadfastness and patience. And let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play. Glory be to God. Have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects lacking nothing. The Message Bible says it like this. Consider it a sheer gift. Mm. Wait a minute. Trials, challenges that come to steal our faith, I'm supposed to consider that a gift? Mm. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. The New Living Translation says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Wow. Hallelujah. This will give us a different perspective of how we look at the challenges, the trials that come in our life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we give God praise for Dr. Hudson? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Could you tell I was struggling a little bit to see it? Amen. <laughs> Somebody say, heal his eyes, Father. Heal his eyes. Or make him wear his glasses. Amen. <laughs> Scripture tells us that we have a great opportunity. Say opportunity. Opportunity. To receive joy when trials come. Yeah, you can say to receive joy when trials come opportunity. There's a, I, I, I was reading a while ago, um, actually some years ago, uh, I had the opportunity of um, kind of upgrading my wife's wedding ring, praise God, and I told, I shared this story with you guys, and, and uh, when, we, when we bought, when I bought the, the upgraded ring, because the first ring that I bought was a nice ring, praise God, it was 24 years ago, 25 years ago, amen. But it was at 25 years ago, praise God, it was, it, it was a blessing, but it was a little blessing, amen? And so we had the opportunity to, to, to upgrade that, and I think we were at our 10-year uh, anniversary or something like that, and, and went to, to get the ring, and, and uh, there were different rings, and I asked, I asked the jeweler, I said, hey, listen, how do you, you know, I know you got the eyeglass and you're kind of looking and you're checking all the refraction and reflection and the, the clarity of the stones. How do you really, how does the layman person tell if it's a real or it's a fake? And, he, and you know, and, and at, at first he, he began to talk about some of the science around it. And he said, you know what, don't worry, don't worry about all that. There's an old school, sure way to tell if it's a real stone or if it's a fake. He said, it's the water test. I said, tell me about that. He said, it's quite simple. He said, when you put a fake diamond and submerge it into water, the brilliance leaves. It becomes, the clarity of it leaves. It becomes fogged. And you can see immediately, no, this is a, what, what Jewish call a stas. It's a fake, unauthentic diamond, an authentic stone. But when you put a real stone and you submerge it into the water, it'll retain its brilliance. Mm -hmm. It'll retain its clarity. It'll retain its vibrance. And it'll look just as glorious submerged as it is not submerged. Ooh. Well, I believe that there's a water test for us as Christians. I believe that the submerging, that the pressure of the water, that the pressure of life, the pressure of the world, the trials that come are going to reveal the authentic and those that are not. Amen. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. The book of Job, and you don't have to turn here, but Job says this in the fifth chapter in verse number seven. Hallelujah. He says, yet man is born under trouble. As the sparks fly upward. 
Meaning that each one of us are going to have trouble in our lives. Each one of us are going to go through a time or a season or a valley that there are trials and challenges. How do we know our church just came out of a time of a challenge? Why? Because we weren't sure where we were going to go. And it was not so many weeks ago that we were still looking with the end of a lease coming, praise God, and not sure what's happening. I mean, that's a trial. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Somebody say, Father, help me pass the water test. There are some keys. There are some, there are some characteristics that the authentic believer will demonstrate when submerged in the trials and pressures of life. And I'm going to share with you some of these keys and some of these characteristics coming from Scripture so that you can keep a mirror in front of you, so that you can evaluate yourself, so that we can leave this place and say, Father, help me in this area, and thank you for giving me victory in this area. So if you're taking notes and if you need a, a title for this, I'm going to give you five keys to victorious living. Five keys to victory. Five keys to victory. These keys to victory will be demonstrated in our lives when trials come. Can you say amen? Amen. The first point I want to make, the first characteristic, when you are submerged, when you are under pressure, believer, brethren, is that a true believer, a true Christian, a true disciple, an ambassador of Christ is going to have an attitude of joy. An attitude of joy. He said, my brethren, those that call yourself believers, those that, that, that have received Jesus Christ, those that have examined themselves, my brethren, <coughs> count it all joy when you fall, when you find yourself in different challenges and pressures of life. Count it all joy. This is an attitude that we must display. It is a mindset that we must display. To, to count means to consider, to evaluate. When that thing comes, it's an opportunity, the scripture says. To receive joy in the midst of the challenge and the pressure that is before me. Now, joy is it's not a nat joy, joy it, it's not a natural characteristic when pressure is there. Now, let me say that again. It, it's not a natural characteristic. If you if you happen to stub anybody ever stubbed your toe on the end of your bed in the morning when you're getting up, because you're kind of sleepy. Uh, and you're not, and maybe, maybe I've been, I was in a hotel room, praise God. And you know, in my bedroom, I can kind of almost subconsciously know where stuff is. I know the bed's here, I know the table's here, and there's a can here, and, right? But you wake up in an environment that is not, that you're not used to, you may not remember where stuff is. And if you're, if it's dark in the room, and if, if, if they're, if they're, if they're kind of groggy, you might find yourself stubbing your toe. You see, we don't always have the ability to control our environment. And life sometimes has obstacles and challenges that create us to stub our toe. The question is, when you stub your toe, what comes out of you then? Somebody say, have mercy. Have mercy. Somebody say, have mercy. Because I, I know what can come out of us when we stub our toe. When, when the pressures of life happen, when, when stuff goes on, I, and, and there's pain and there's uncomfort, I understand what could come out of us. I can, I can understand the words that might come. I might understand the, the actions that might come. But, but when we're submerged, joy. It's not a natural response. It's not an automatic response. I've got to train myself. I've got to be disciplined in when I find myself in an adverse situation. Oh, I don't like the way this feels. I don't like the way it looks. Hallelujah, God. 
God, I know you're going to do something. This is for my benefit. It's for my good. I have an attitude. Somebody say an attitude. attitude. Of joy. Amen. You got to make a conscious commitment to face each trial with an attitude of joy. Paul tells the church at Philippi in the fourth chapter, verse four, he says, rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Mm -hmm. See, y'all, somebody ought to be correcting me. Rejoice in the Lord when it feels good. Rejoice in the Lord. Here you rejoice in the Lord now and then. No, oh, rejoice in the Lord always. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. He went, he was audacity to say, and I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. <laughs> Verse 11, he says, Now that I speak in respect of, of want, for I have learned in whatsoever place, whatever state I'm in, to be content, to have joy, no matter where I'm at. Whether I'm in the mansion or I'm in the efficiency, whether I'm in the Mercedes or on the bus. Or using Chevy and Ford to get down the street. Mm -mm. Hallelujah. Count it all joy. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. Hallelujah. The second, the second point I want to share with you today, glory be to God, is I have to have, when I'm going through the trials of life, when I'm going through the pressures of life, when I'm submerged in the water, I've got to have an understanding mind. Not only did he tell us, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, he said, you've got to have an understanding mind. Verse 3 says, knowing this, look at your neighbor and say, you got to know something. There's got to be something on the inside of you that you know, that you're not struggling with, that you're not challenged about, that you're not going back and forth over. Knowing this, what, Pastor, what, what, what? That the trying, the temptation, the trial, the trying of your faith worketh. You ever think God might just be trying to get you to patience? Amen. Amen. He might be trying to usher you to a greater dispensation of patience. Why? Because it's going to take patience and faith to inherit what? His promise. It, it doesn't take faith alone to inherit the promise. It takes faith and patience. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. And God has some promises for you. God has some promises for me. But he doesn't work inside of time. God is outside of time. He has created time for you and I to work in the dispensation of. But he does not work in the dispensation of time. And so where you might want and I might want the manifestation of God's promises right now. We talked last week that my faith right now is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things that are not yet Seen. So I have to have faith right now. Amen. But it's faith right now and patience to get to that which I hope for. Oh, Father. Some of us are hoping for a certain <clears throat> kind of financial status. Some of us are hoping for a new house and a, and a new job and that education. Some of us are hoping that our children come back to the Lord. Somebody that hoping that this, this, this marriage, this relationship, it moves from where it is to where, it, where we want it to be. And God says, listen, you've got to have faith right now. But you've got to have faith and patience to inherit the promise. So the trial, the pressure, I've got to know that it is here for a purpose to produce in me Patience, somebody yell patience. patience. Somebody yell patience. patience. There's some, there are some things you've got to know. You must know the reason for the testing. Trials are designed to produce patience. And it's important that we understand the word endurance in this text. It means patiently waiting on God to remove the trial. Amen. Patience. 
I'm patiently waiting on God to remove the trial, the test, the pressure. Glory be to God. The third point I would like to make that we take out of this scripture is when I am I am submerged under the trials and pressures of this life, I have to have a submissive will. A submissive will. Count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh, produceth patience, and watch this, but let patience have her perfect work. Somebody say, I got to let that happen. I got to let that happen. I have to let patience have her perfect work. Understand that God gave you, Marissa. God gave you, Jay. God gave you, Levy. God gave us all a free will. And he set before us life and death, blessings and cursings. And he told us to do what? He said, choose life, which means that I can choose life or I can do what? Choose death. The choice is mine. For patience to have her perfect work, I've got to let it happen. And for me to let it happen, I have to live submissive to God's voice. Amen. I've got to be submissive. I have to allow, I have to yield I have to do what Jesus did. I have to understand. I have to believe this is me speaking. I have to believe that Jesus, when he was on the cross and he was bearing our sins, somebody say my sins. My my sins. sins. When he had already gone through hours of crucifixion, he had already been spat on, whipped, excrement thrown on him. They were talking bad about him. They made him carry a cross up Golgotha Hill. And then they had the audacity to nail his hands to a cross and nail his feet to a cross and put a crown of thorns upon his head. I have to believe, this is just me speaking, this is my interpretation. I have to believe that the human side of Jesus was at least tempted, if he's tempted at all points like we are, I have to believe that the human side of Jesus wanted to get that over with quickly. That, that he remember, I am all powerful. I can come off this cross at any moment. But he said, I'm going to submit my will to your will, Father. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, many of us allow our will to become our God. This choice that we have. It determines whether we're going to come to church on Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. This will. This will will determine what our priorities in life are. Mm -hmm. I have a priority to be at work. I have a priority to do this. I have a priority to do that. I have a priority. My priorities are just indicative of my will. I can choose to allow patience to have her perfect work, or I can choose not to. I can choose to allow God's will to move in my life, or I can make a decision to do it on my own. I'm telling you I've made this mistake. I'm telling you I've made the mistake to try to supersede God's will and walk in emotion and walk in a, in a mindset that I, I can't wait. I don't know what you're doing, God. I'm going to work this out myself. And I, I messed stuff up. Mm -hmm. I've messed stuff up because I wouldn't allow patience to have a perfect will. I wouldn't have a submissive will. You see, when we're submerged under the trial and under the pressures of this life, if we're going to be like that authentic diamond when it's submerged in water and shine and continue to be brilliant, I've got to, while submerged, demonstrate submission. To God's will. Whatever you do, don't fight the trial. Don't fight the trial. The trial is not your enemy. The trial, the test, the pressure, it has come to work something in you. Somebody say, don't fight the trial. Don't fight the trial. 
Psalm 37 and 5 says, commit thy way unto the Lord and trust also in him. And what's going to happen? He shall bring it to pass. The work is God's to do. It's not mine to do. My job is to let, let patience have her perfect will. Point number four. Point number four. The fourth key to victory is that you must have a believing heart. A believing heart. What do you mean, Pastor? It, you see, what's ever in your heart, whatever your heart believes, that's going to, if, if your heart is literally tethered, that's the nice word. There's a nice word. That's how I love that. I, I'm taking a quick pit stop because I'm remembering something. And I said in one of our youth services when she was preaching, it has become one of my favorite quotes. She said, my prayer tethers me to God. Whew. Whew. She must have been 14, 15 when she said that. My prayer tethers me to God. A tether is a connection. It's a, it, is a, it, is a, it is a rope. It is a hook. It is a yoke that yokes me to God. My, my prayer is a tether to God. Our heart is a tether to our flesh and our heart is a tether to our soul. Our, our spirit. The heart 